I am going to uh, pray a prayer that comes from Pete Greed this morning. Pete is the head of the 24-7 prayer movement. And Pete wrote some words that I think are helpful to us in the midst of what Israel is facing. Uh, The tension that erupted there yesterday and the many, many lives that have already been lost, the people who have been captured, taken hostage, both sides. And so would you allow me, um, we would be amiss as God's people not to pray for the tension that's over there this morning. So pray with me. God of Israel, Lord of all nations, Prince of Peace, we cry out to you today for the frightened, hurting people of Israel and Gaza, these very lands that you know so well. First, we pray with all of our hearts for those grieving the sudden loss of loved ones, those who've been captured, those whose homes have suddenly been destroyed, A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Second, we pray for a miraculous de-escalation of this dangerous conflict. Terrible things have been done. Hundreds have died. Thousands are in hospital. Many are suddenly grieving, but we pray that reason would reduce retribution, retribution and that mercy would somehow prevail prevail over judgment. May Israel's military response be decisive and proportionate, and may other nations with a vested interest in escalating this crisis somehow be restrained. The text says, He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And finally, Lord, We pray for active and effective peacemaking at an international political level. May the measured voices of diplomacy prevail over warmongering on every side. For Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. It's kind of weird to preach after that. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. We move uh, this morning from a five-week series we did called Live Like That that was in 1 Peter chapter 2 to the words of Paul in Ephesians 2 as we transition to a new series just for four weeks on freedom. How can we live like that if we're in bondage? So how does Jesus come to produce freedom in our lives? There's a clip that um, we have had uh, previous years uh, we've shown called Uh, from a movie called The Mission. I'm not going to show it this morning. It's all queued up, ready to go, but I'm watching the clock. Um, But I want you to hear Ephesians chapter 2 from the message. Nicole, am I able to? Perfect. From the message. It wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief, and then you exhaled disobedience. We all did it. All of us doing what we felt like doing when we felt like doing it. All of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. No, instead, immense in mercy and with an incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did all this on his own with no help from us. And then he picked us up 
and he set us down in the highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. Now God has us where he wants us, with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea. It's all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No. We neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work that he does, the good work that he's gotten ready for us to do, the work that we had better be doing. So good to hear scripture read well. This clip from the mission that I was telling you about, some of you that are old like me may remember this movie. Robert De Niro is climbing up the cliffs carrying a massive sack of garbage. He's been estranged from these people that he'd gone as a missionary to try to help. One of the missionaries comes over and in a language that we don't under one, one of the uh, inhabitants comes over in a language we don't understand comes with a great big knife and cuts the bag of garbage off the back of De Niro who begins to weep because now he's free. We come to this passage in Ephesians chapter 2 that Nicole just read for us and this is what Paul's trying to get at. I want to talk about this text this morning, but right from the very beginning, tell you that the illustration that I'm going to use winding all the way through it uh, is borrowed, stolen, begged, wh whatever. Um, it's not mine. It's uh, one of my favorite preachers' name is Jim Dethmer. And Dethmer does this, and when I have heard this sermon, I just go, you can't improve on this. So I'm going to use it, but I'm going to tell you it's his. We have a problem, Paul says in verse 1. We're dead. That's what he says in the text. As for you, you were dead. Now, he's not talking physically, of course. We're here. We're alive. We're listening to this. Got it. But he says, you were powerless. That's what the word means. You can't do anything about this. Why? You're powerless in your transgressions and in your sins. You're powerless to stop doing the things you know you ought to stop doing and powerless to start doing the things that you should start doing. I don't know when Paul says it in the book of Romans. Why is it, he says, why is it that I keep doing the things I know I gotta stop doing and I don't do the things I know I should do? Good thing none of us feel like that. Hmm. You're dead, he said. You're powerless to accomplish that which you want to accomplish. You're bound up, not free. We're bound up even by the fact that we don't realize we're powerless. Ron, I know you like to go boating. Imagine if you're boating on the Niagara River above the Niagara Falls and you've got a little boat and the engine conks out. You're dead. Powerless in that boat to do anything. And that's what Paul's telling us about our lives. He said your condition is you're dead. And there are three causes, he says, in verse 2 and 3. Let me read them. He says, he says you're uh, dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature. Three things, three reasons, three causes. First, he says, culture or the ways of the world were bound up and controlled by the ways of the world. 
we can't differentiate between what the world says is the way to go and what God says in his kingdom is the way to go. I posted something last night on Realm. My guess is many of you didn't see it. Um, I was kind of hoping you wouldn't see it until after the talk today, but I posted it there, and it's the complete article of which I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs right now. There was an author a number of years ago, Ron Sider, who wrote a book called The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience. And I've pulled a couple of quotes from this because rather than me rant and rave about the culture and how we're all caught up in it, listen to his words. Here's what he says. George Gallup and George Barna's polls demonstrate that evangelical Christians are as likely to embrace lifestyles every bit as hedonistic, materialistic, self-centered, and sexually immoral as the world in general. Divorce is more common among born-again Christians than even in the general American population. Only 6% of evangelicals tithe. White evangelicals are the most likely to object to neighbors of another race. Sexual promiscuity of evangelical youth is only a little less outrageous than that of their non-evangelical peers. Alan Wolf concludes, the truth is there is increasingly little difference between the entertainment in- industry and the bring them in at any cost efforts of evangelical megachurches. George Barnard concludes, every day the church is becoming more and more like the world it allegedly seeks to change. Compare this, he says, with the accounts of the vitality and reputation of the early church in the first three centuries of existence, and you'll see how far we've fallen. In the second century, Justin Martyr said of Christians, those who once delighted in fornication now embrace chastity alone. We who once took most pleasure in accumulating wealth and property now share with everyone in need. We who hated and killed one another and would not associate with men of different tribes because of their different customs now, since the coming of Christ, live familiarly with them and pray for them as our enemies. Writing in about A.D. 125, the Christian apologist Aristides described Christians with these words, They walk in all humility and kindness, and falsehood is not found among them. They love one another. They do not despise the widow nor grieve the orphan. He that has distributes liberally to those who do not have. If they see a stranger, they bring him under their roof and rejoice over him, as if it were their own brother. For they call themselves brethren, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit and God. But when one of their poor passes away from the world, and any of them sees him, then he provides for his burial according to his ability. And if they hear that any of their number is in prison or oppressed for the name of their Messiah, all of them provide for his needs. And if it's possible that he may be delivered, they deliver him. And if there is among them a man that is poor and needy, and they do not have abundance of necessaries, they fast two or three days so they may supply the needy with their necessary food. Paul says you're dead. You're dead in your transgressions and sins. And one of the causes is that is that we've been swayed by the culture. But we say everybody's doing it, so it can't be wrong. It's evidence that we're bound. But he says there's another reason that you're dead. You're dead because of the devil. Or in Ephesians chapter 2, he says the ruler of the kingdom of the air. C.S. Lewis, the author of uh, Chronicles of Narnia, said it this way. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devil. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. In other words, we're bound on either end of this. We either ignore the work of the devil or we pay too much attention to it. But I think sometimes we're bound because of the fact we say, well, the devil made me do it. Sometimes, sometimes there's oppression, sometimes there's spiritual battles. But maybe we're bound by a lack of knowledge of these spiritual battles. Maybe we're bound by making excuses, relieving ourselves from responsibility. I think in the next three weeks, as Deb talks about each of these things, I think we need to pay attention to the level of spiritual battles on around us. We're dead because of the culture, we're dead because of the devil. We're dead in our transgressions and sins because 
the self. Gratifying the cravings of the flesh. I did it my way. Come on, sin's fun. If, we, if it wasn't fun, we wouldn't do it. It's fun. And in the moment, it seems like, well, it's not a big deal. You've heard of the little kid that, two little kids, brother and sister, they were fighting and the mom pulled them apart when the boy had kicked the girl in the stomach and pulled her hair. And the little boy said, well, the devil made me kick her in the stomach. But I thought of pulling her hair all by myself. Friends, sometimes culture gets us caught up and swept up in all the things that are going on. We see it all around us. Sometimes there's a demonic influence. But come on, so often it's because we have decided to do our own thing. We're bound by this deep-seated lie that we hear over and over and over again every time we turn around. We are the masters of our own lives. Somehow life to the fullest depends on us and the choices we make. You're on the Niagara River. Your engine conks out. You're dead. You're powerless to do anything. And all of a sudden, the current of the water, the current of the ways of the world starts pushing you faster and faster towards the edge of the falls. The wind comes up and starts to blow you. And then, like an idiot, you stand up on the gunnels of the boat and start glumping, pushing yourself faster and faster towards the edge. This is the state, Paul says, that we're in. We're bound by all these things. So he says there's consequences. Look at verse 3 with me and hear the words of Paul back in verse 3. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Here we go. Like the rest, we were by nature, what? Deserving of wrath or said in another translation, objects of wrath. Now what is that? Our condition is dead. The causes are the culture, the devil, and our own selfish desires. The consequences are we're separated from God. We hear objects of wrath, and immediately we think, well, yeah, God's this mean, horrible ogre that doesn't want the best for us. Come on. That's not even close to the truth. That's not what that means. That means that we have separated ourselves from God. And that the objects of wrath, the wrath is the reality that we've created this space Between us and God, he's not moved. But we have. We're dead in the water, carried by the current, blown by the wind, pushing ourselves to the inevitable. We're about to go over the falls. Don't we see it in our own lives? We drive down East Hastings, see all forms of horrible bondage that people are in. Addiction to drugs, alcohol, poverty, mental illness, homelessness. Yeah, those people are in bondage. And what about what about our street? What caused those people to be on East Hastings? Culture? Yeah, you bet. There's a lot of that in there. The devil? Yeah, you bet. He's the destroyer of life. Self? Yeah, many of them perhaps made decisions that weren't wise. But before we just point fingers at people on East Hastings or other places, I'm using that only as an example. Look on your street. Look in your house. Look in your life. What are the forms of bondage that we're in? We have transgressions and sins. Just the same as others. Why do we think that our transgressions and sins don't leave us just as powerless as other people we see? We too are dead. Dead without power to change. We too have addictions. They just might look different. Maybe it's to sex, to money, to food, to entertainment, to power. We too are in bondage.
I don't know the right words. I don't know how to say it, and I can't certainly force you to understand it. But tell me I'm wrong. There are times when we are so deeply entrenched in the ways of the world, in the story of our culture, we're not even able to see it. We're not even able to see that this is so contrary to what God is after. And I'm not pointing fingers at you. I had one this week where somebody said something to me. And I went, oh my goodness, I can't even see it. I'm so blind to this. We choose to do things our own way every day and then wonder where God is. Like as if God's some genie that magically comes along and makes our life better. We need freedom. If we're going to live like that, like we talked about for the last five weeks, we have to be released from the bondage that we're in. Our bondage comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Sometimes it's because of decisions we've made. Sometimes it's because of the culture we live in. Sometimes it's the devil that does it. Sometimes it's the pain that others have inflicted on us. Every single one of us carries some of it and we need to be set free. So where do we turn? Skip down with me to verse 8 and 9. For Paul in verses 8 and 9 says, Look, this isn't of yourselves. Love the way Nicole read it from Eugene Peterson. It's not by works so that no one can boast. It's not like you did a little bit. You didn't, because even if you did a little bit, you'd think you did the whole thing. Paul says, no, that kind of solution where you do it on your own is rubbish. But we do it all the time. We try to live by good works. And by good works, what are we talking about? We're trying to solve this problem of being dead or powerless in our own strength. We're not measuring up. We're not measuring up in others' eyes, so what do we do? Maybe somebody's hurt us or undervalued us, so we try to find value in the things of the world. Maybe we're not living up in our own eyes. Somehow I haven't sort of reached the level that I want, so I try harder to fix things. Or, or maybe I haven't measured up in God's eyes. I've blown it. I've sinned and I need to fix it. There's nothing that we can do that makes him love us more. And nothing we can do that makes him love us less. But what do we do? We read self-help books. We try harder. We get a coach. We do more. We give more. We work more. We produce more. Why? Why do we do this? Why do I do this? Because the answer is, it's, it's there when we stop and we think about it. Because we live in the wrong story. We live in the story of the world that has sold us this lie over and over and over again that your value comes from your achievement or doing more or giving more or being higher in power on the ladder in your company. Paul says we need to be free. This won't work. We try. We try harder. And you know what happens. It works okay for a while. Just think of a diet. It works okay for a while, right? Then we fail. We're exhausted. He says, you can't do that spiritually. You're dead in the water. You grab a paddle thinking that somehow you can fight the current and fight the wind and fight this reality that you're heading towards the falls. And he says, you start paddling and realizing, oh, for a little while, you're kind of holding your own. And you smash the paddle on a rock and your knuckles get all bloody and you're holding only the handle and you keep trying to paddle, keep trying to avoid the inevitable. We're exhausted. We're tired. We're afraid. We feel inferior. 
Now, there's another way, Paul says. Go back with me to verse 4. Greatest line in this whole passage. He says, the other way is this, but God. That's what it says in verse 4. Oh, I know there's another little phrase in there because of his great love. That's a modifying phrase, so just move that out of the way for a minute. But God. There it is. This is not about us fixing something. This is about God setting us free and doing the work in our lives. Paul says three things about God in verses 4, 5, and 6. Right there at the beginning, this is about God's agency because he has great love. There's the first. What is, why does he need the great? Why doesn't he just say love? Because the great underlines the reality that he initiates. It's not us that does it. It's he that initiates. He's the one that went after us. One of the great things about the Jewish faith, Abraham Heschel, one of their greatest um, historians, said it this way, greatest theologians. He said, God's, uh, Ju- Ju- Judaism is about God's search for man, not man's search for God. He says, not only is God's love great, but he's rich in mercy. What is that? It means he doesn't turn a blind eye to all that we've done. He pays the cost. Lots of illustrations we could give there. His great love, he's rich in mercy. And then he says, and he has this amazing grace. What's grace? We get mercy and grace mixed up. Mercy is where God forgives us. He doesn't give us what we deserve. Grace is God's power at work in us to accomplish that which we cannot accomplish. We were powerless, dead. And now, he says, I'm pouring my grace into your life to do three things. I'm going to change your condition. He says in verse 5, hear these words. He, here, he, he, I'm going to start at four again. But because of his great love for us, there's the first, God who is rich in mercy, there's the second, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It's not us that makes us alive again. It's him that makes us alive. He changes our condition from being dead to now being alive. And then he continues. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. There's the second thing. The cause for us being dead was the culture of the devil and our own decisions. The cause now for us not being demised, not going over the cliff, but instead being saved, and not only saved. What does it say that happens to us? We're not only rescued from going over Niagara Falls, what happens to us? We're raised up and seated next to Christ. We're not just set free so that we don't die. We're set free so that we're raised up to be seated next to him. Therefore, we're moved from our demise to being seated next to Christ. And in verse 7, he tells us the consequences. Raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Verse 7, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Expressed to us, expressed in his kindness to us. In Christ. What's he saying? The consequences are this. Not that we're separated from God. But that he's glorified. Because we become trophies of his grace. In other words, God raises us up to be seated next to Jesus. And puts us on display. So that every single person and every spiritual being can say... Jim is a trophy of God's grace. Ron is a trophy of God's grace. Do you see it? On our own, we're going over the falls, but no, God, because he is full of love, his great love initiates and rescues us and doesn't just rescue us, but seats us at the right hand of Jesus so that we become trophies of his grace. Last verse. Skip with me down to verse 10. What difference does Jesus make in our lives? 
hear the words that Paul says. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. Two things. We're his masterpiece. When he sets us free, he signs his name and declares that you, me, are his. We are his masterpiece. He is proud and recognizes that we are his. And it says, and we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. In other words, we join with him on mission. We are his masterpiece. We become his and he declares to the whole world, you're mine. And he sends us on mission. Created not to do good works to try to prove that we're okay. But to join with him in good works as he redeems all the world. Friends, we are in bondage, but Christ has come to set us free. And we're going to hear over the next three weeks how we can be released from each of these and need to be released from each of these. Pray with me before Craig comes and leads us in communion. Jesus, we confess to you we are powerless. Powerless to save ourselves but we glorify you that in Christ Jesus we have been set free. Now, Lord Jesus, would you come upon us in power, the power of your spirit. Would you come and fill us? Would you set us free? Would you release us from all the things that we keep trying to carry along in the journey? Would you do a powerful work in me and in us over the next month as we learn what it means to be free in and through Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Why don't we stand together as we come to celebrate communion. And um, what a great first step if we want to say yes to that invitation that Cam has laid before us to go on this journey of being released from bondage and growing in freedom. We have brought our gifts of generosity to this table, but a great gift awaits us as we come to the table, as we hold the bread, as we drink the juice. And so we'll pass out the bread, and then let's hold it together. We'll take it as one body um, today. So Wayne, Jorn, you guys are close there. Would you start the bread moving around? Greeters, would you just make sure that everybody grabs a piece. Let's move that around and then I'll lead us in um, taking, taking the bread this morning. <laughs>